So as I said, I think last time, since I'm going to be traveling starting on Friday, uh, this is the last official class. Well, this is the last class in which I'll be present, and I won't I won't reappear before the final exam. So I'm sorry about that, but it is what it is. Uh, on Friday, Al in lecture demo will will play the YouTube video that I've already posted, the review of this class. It's, it happens to be from last year rather than this year. But he'll, so he'll play it here, but you can watch on YouTube at your leisure, too, if you want to come in and, and uh, <laughs> bring popcorn. That's good, too. Uh, the final exam is Thursday morning, 9 to 12, um, December 8th. Any, other, any questions about course material stuff? The evaluation for this course should be online at this point and available, and I encourage you to, to complete it. And there's a hard deadline set by the university. I, I emailed you what it was, and I don't remember. Jewel? Do you need do you, you do not need to bring a Scantron. They'll have Scantrons here. Uh, you're, you're not sent the course evaluation. It was part of an email I sent to you with three things on it, one of which was a, a, a do, do the course evaluation. It's on Colab. Uh, I think when you, when you go into Colab and log in, I think on the left, there's a bar on the left that includes course evaluations. And it's not, in this, it's not associated with a specific class. It's sort of in your, in your brand view of the world, part of Colab. It's just for, for, for evaluating all your classes. They, they should all be up there. It's run by the university. Other questions? OK. So, so uh, Back to musical instruments, which will be our, our last topic, finishing up. Uh, so far, I, I've talked about stringed instruments. And to, to stay a step back even from that, uh, based on some of my discussions with people from the class talking about the homework, a couple of points to just make sure it's, it's totally clear that harmonic oscillators, this, this whole chapter is all about harmonic oscillators. Musical instruments, by and large, are harmonic oscillators. Uh, they always have an inertial part and a spring-like influence that establishes an equilibrium. And the, the, the rhythm is set by the battle between the inertial part, which wants things to go straight, and the spring-like restoring influence that wants things to settle at equilibrium, or to, to be at equilibrium. They fight each other. And the bigger the inertial part, the slower the motion is, because the, the, the harder it is for the spring-like restoring influence to get the attention of the inertial part. It's, it's got more inertia. It wants to go straight, and it just, it just it resists turning around and coming back. Uh, on the other hand, the stiffer the spring-like restoring influence, the faster it, it is able to turn around the inertial thing and bring it back. So the, so, so the, the, the period gets shorter. It, it cycles faster. And just you know, random examples of this, uh, springboards or any, any bar that's fixed at one end has a behavior. It's pretty much a, it's a harmonic oscillator. It, f it fulfills the requirements. It has a stable equilibrium, namely straight. And if you pull it away from equilibrium, it develops a restoring influence that pushes it back towards equilibrium. And that restoring influence is proportional to how far you pull it away. That is the recipe for harmonic oscillator. Once you've got that, you, you get this, the behavior of a harmonic oscillator. The most interesting part of which is that its period of oscillation or its frequency of oscillation, they are reciprocals of one another, one over each other. Frequency is one over period, period is one over frequency. Those two quantities are independent of how big the motion is, the extent, the amplitude of the motion. So whether I, I bend this thing a little, I mean, you can't see that very well, but let me do this one, which you can see better. That motion, whether I make it a little motion or a big motion, it's the same rhythm. The frequency is the same. The period is the same. If I, to, to, to change the period, I have to actually change either the stiffness of the spring or the mass of the inertial thing. So I can change the mass, so that, that's its original mass. If I add more mass, it goes slower. It's more obvious with this floppy, with this floppy ruler. This guy, that's got a pretty fast period. It, it, uh, 
But if I, if I add mass to it, it goes much slower. I've, I've made it harder for the spring to get the attention of, of the inertial part and pull it back to center. Is that okay? Any questions about the basic features of a harmonic oscillator? Everything else is examples. And the first examples were all these clock timekeepers, the pendulum, the uh, balance ring, this wheel rocks back and forth with a spring uh, setting the equilibrium, and the tuning forks. And I, I have tuning forks now. So, so here, th this, is, this is a giant tuning fork. You would not want this in your wristwatch, right? Um, it's got a very low frequency because it's got a lot of mass, and it's pretty stiff, but not super stiff. If we make it much smaller, these guys, that's got a much higher pitch because it's, you can't hear it for interesting reasons, which I'll come to. Now you can hear it. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. All right. So with, with, with the strings of last time and stringed instruments, we discovered, wow, they are another harmonic oscillator, a string that is pulled taut, so it has tension in it. And, and tension is something I haven't talked much about with the semester. I used to do, do some, I used to talk about pulleys and things years ago. We used to have, and in fact, the pulleys are still up there. Uh, they were a fun topic, but there are too many topics that are fun. So, but what tension is, is, is if you take something, a, a string or something like a string, and you pull on one side with a force, say, of 100 newtons, uh, if, if, that's not, if that's unbalanced, of course, the thing is going to accelerate. So if you pull on the, on the second side with another force of 100 newtons in the other direction, the string or spring is under tension. It's, the net force on it is zero because it's got the same force on one side as it has in the other direction on the other side. No net force. But there's tension in the entire string. And that establishes a, an equilibrium shape for the string straight. If you want to make it, uh, take it out of shape, you have to pull. And that was my chin, right, last time? I'll stop doing that. But anyway, when you, when you have a string that's under tension, it has an equilibrium shape, and it has restoring forces that show up that turn out to be proportional to displacement. It's a little bit oversimplified, but, but the idea is there. And the result is you get, these, you get motions that are harmonic oscillator motions, this one. This is the fundamental vibrational mode of a string. A single arc up and down. It's, it's, it, it, is a, it is a trigonometric sine function. It's, you know, it's got all kinds of interesting mathematics, but that's not this class. Okay? What complicates the story is this is not just one harmonic oscillator. It actually can behave as many harmonic oscillators. This is the fundamental mode. And one of these days, I'll, I'll, I'll get good at doing the. Can I get the. I've done it before. I've got to get good at it soon. That, that, I go twice as fast, I should get it. This is really frustrating. I'm almost there. Come on, come on, you can do it. Anyway, I did it last time. I'll have more work ahead of me. All right? You can get it going as two half strings, and it vibrates at twice the frequency. It is therefore called the second harmonic mode, uh, where harmonic means it's an integer multiple of the fundamental frequency. So when this is, oh, okay, I can do the fundamental frequency. This is the fundamental frequency for the tension that I've put into it. Uh, if I managed successfully to get it to vibrate as two half strings, it would be vibrating twice as fast, twice the frequency, twice the pitch, and it is then in the second harmonic mode. If I got it as three one-third strings, I would have the third harmonic mode and so on. And strings can do all, they can do that. They can do the strings of a real instrument, a violin, for example. It can vibrate as, as a single arc. It can vibrate as two half strings, three one-third strings, four one-four strings, and so on. And it naturally, it tends to do all of them at once in various uh, mixtures. If it's, uh, it, uh, yeah. all right. You okay with strings? Questions? All right. So next issue is, Okay, the strings vibrate like this. 
where does the sound come from? And in fact, that brings up the issue of what sound, what is sound? Normal sound in air. Sound can travel through things other than air. You know, you know from swimming, it's, it can travel through water. But when it travels through air, it consists of compressions and rarefactions of the air itself. Air likes to be at, it has an equilibrium. The air in this room is at equilibrium when its pressure is uniform everywhere, neglecting the minor variations due to gravity. Uh, gra the, the, the gravity issue is, 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 not in, is not important for sound, so we can set it aside. You, you know the pressure is a little higher down here than it is up there, but neglecting that, the pressure in this room tends to go to uniform everywhere. If it weren't, air would accelerate towards the lower pressure and tend to fill it in as though, as though you had uh, a, a, a pond of water that had a low spot and a high spot. The, the high spot tends to flow to fill in the low spot. Same thing with air, tends to flow to fill in the low pressure spot. So when everything settles down, pressure's everywhere, uniform. But you can distort it away from uniform locally, for example, by just clapping. When I did that, I'm taking a portion of air, shoving it together, increasing its density, and therefore its pressure. And then I let it go. So suddenly I've got a portion of high pressure air surrounded by uh, atmospheric pressure, or maybe even a little below, because I sort of stole some air from somewhere. And what happens is the air begins to move, and it moves and it, it does various uh, overshooting. It coasts through equilibrium again. It has all those characteristics of these harmonic oscillators that we've been talking about. And we'll see that when you confine the air into pipes, you can get these motions to be really to be harmonic oscillators. But in, in the, open, the open expanse of, of this room, the air does vibrate about uniform uh, pressure. And those vibrations are waves. And I, I, told you, I told you last time that waves on a limited extended object are standing waves. And they, they, don't, they don't go anywhere. They dance in place. These are the most fundamental, the most basic. Uh, I can't even get the fundamental. The most basic wave in a limited object is a standing wave like this. The most basic wave in an extended object that doesn't have limits, and this room essentially doesn't have limits. Um, that's a detail, you know, what does it mean to not have limits? Are traveling waves. They go somewhere. And so as I'm talking here, what are you hearing? Cut, you know, cut to the chase. I'm creating compressions and rarefactions of the air. I'm, I'm ultimately packing the molecules a little too tightly, and the pressure goes up. A little too loosely, the pressure goes down, back and forth. And those disturbances in the air that, at, at, my, at my voice uh, travel as ripples of regions of, of excessive pressure and uh, too little pressure. They ripple along through the air. They travel very fast, uh, on the order of 300 meters per second, just about, about a mile every five seconds and they zip off. They travel, uh, it actually does not depend on the frequency of the, of the ripple, which is important. The pitch of the sound doesn't have any direct effect on how fast it travels, which is, which is important. It means that everybody at the instrument, uh, when, when, when they're playing Beethoven's fifth and dun 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 dun, that all the different pitches that go into the dun travel out together. They don't travel at different speeds. If they did, you would hear the different pitches show at different times. Um, in any case, they travel along, they go past your ear and into your ear, and they push on things, because differences in pressure, above and below atmospheric pressure, exert forces on surfaces, right? Pressure, pressure imbalances, and they cause responses in your ear, which you, which you hear. So that's the, that, that is what sound is. It's these compressions and rarefactions of the air that propagate, they travel as, as ripples through the air. A very simple introduction to it, to what is sound. Is that okay? Um, the, 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 these oscillating motions and stuff, they do depend on things like the density of the air. There is, there is harmonic oscillator behavior even in the open air, and consequently things, the speed of sound actually depends on, for example, on the density of the air. Uh, it, sound travels faster in, in something that responds more easily, like helium. The, the speed of sound is faster in helium than it is in air. All right. So, have you talked then about sound? How do you how do you project sound out of a stringed instrument? 
Well, it turns out strings themselves are very are, are, are pitiful at, at projecting sound. The string vibrates back and forth, and it, it does vibrate through the air. And so you might think that it might affect the air a lot. But the air, because the string is typically so, so thin, the air just scoots around it. It flows. Uh, the air does experience, and the string experiences, a little drag force. And you know all about drag forces. It, gets, it experiences pressure drag forces and makes a turbulent wake, and all that gobbledygook. But by and large, the air does not get compressed or rarefied very much. And the consequence is that a string vibrating by itself projects very little sound. And uh, any of you who have played an electric guitar, which is a stringed instrument with a very, typically a very hard uh, wooden structure that, that supports it, um, they're very quiet if you don't plug them in. You can play an electric guitar and you strum away and you barely hear it. Is this familiar to people? It's not like an acoustic guitar. An acoustic guitar, no amplification, uh, is built to project sound. An electric guitar is, built, is not built to project sound. It, it uses electronic stuff to pick up the vibration of the string and turn it into sound. It is not, it's, not, not a, it's not directly creating sound. How do you, you know, what's the problem? The air scoots around that, that narrow string. It doesn't, the string does not get the air's attention very well. So, essentially all ordinary stringed instruments, apart from the electric ones, so all the conventional stringed instruments use something else to actually project the sound. They use a surface. Why a surface? Because a surface is, is much better at getting the air's attention. The air can't scoot around the surface as easily as it can scoot around a string. So this is true of actually not, not just of strings, but of things like a tuning fork. And so the reason I have these funny structures up here, these are resonant cavities for air. They, they have particular frequencies in which the air inside really begins to slosh vigorously. And they help project sound. But a tuning fork by itself, this guy's tuning So this by itself doesn't project very much sound. But you guys can maybe hear it a little bit. But the air is scooting around those, those vibrating tines, I call them, I don't know what, what, what better name they have. To get better projection of sound, you have to, they need the help of, they need the help of, of a structure that sort of has, is able to get the attention of the air. These guys are sort of complicated, but uh, a better example is, these, this tuning fork by itself would be pretty quiet, but it's attached to a box that's good at helping project sound. So you're, the box is vibrating. The so air is being pushed in and out of that surface structure. Probably, probably the, the, the most obvious example is this little tuning bo uh, music box. And yes, it plays hi-ho, hi-ho. Which you can hear very well, right? I'll help it. Can you hear it play? Barely. The little the little fingers that are vibrating in the tuning in the in the music box are terrible at projecting sound for the same reason the air just goes right around them. But if I can you hear it now? Because the air, the air trying to go from the front to back, as the, as the surface moves forward, it, it squishes the air in front of it. The air in front of it goes, whoa, I'm under pressure. I want to get around. You know, tries to scoot around the outside. But it, 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 it can't make it that far and that fast. Uh, this, however, does, does identify why low-pitched surfaces that project low-pitched sounds, like, like woofers, they typically are very big. Because you want to make them big enough that the air doesn't have time to get around behind the woofer. And, and fill in the gap behind it. As, it. as the woofer goes forward, the air is being squeezed in front of it, and it wants to scoot around to fill the void behind the woofer, but it doesn't have time, because that's too big a, a distance to travel. So, the, so, 
surfaces that project low pitches typically have to be bigger than surfaces that project high pitches. Is that okay? Anyway, let's get back to the real story. All the stringed instruments have surfaces. So a violin, you know, what's the point of this elaborate box here? When you buy a Stradivarius, you are not paying for the strings. They're not original. Uh, they, they never visited Cremona, Italy. It's not the strings. It's the box. Because the box is the sound projector. And as the, as the violin strings vibrate back and forth, they move the bridge. This structure. That, that, the bridge often is not original to it. With, with, with the years, they, they replace the bridge. But the bridge's job is to apply forces to that surface of the real violin, shake, change its shape, and cause it to project sound both from its outer surface, back, front and back, and from inside through the hole. And this is true of acoustic guitars as well, and, and pianos. You know, piano is a stringed instrument. Where, is it, where does it sound come from? Not from the strings. It comes from a soundboard that is usually uh, layered parallel to the strings. On a grand piano, it's, it's the bottom, it's below all the strings. On an upright piano, it's at the back of the piano. That is the sound projecting surface. And uh, it's carefully made, carefully tended. You do not want to buy a piano that has a cracked soundboard, for example. It'll misbehave. Harps. The strings, a harp is already a pretty quiet instrument, but it's made, it's given any possibility of being heard by the, by the structure, the wood structure that supports the strings, not the strings themselves. Is that okay? Questions about that? Okay. Wind instruments. So I've talked about stringed instruments. What's vibrating is the string, and the sound is ultimately projected by something else associated with the string. The string vibrates the surface, and out goes the sound. What about wind instruments? In the wind instruments, virtually all of them are, are effectively a pipe. And the pipe is a, is a hollow shell that protects the air inside the pipe from the air outside the pipe. Outside the pipe, the average pressure, in fact, the pressure just in general, is going to be pretty close to atmospheric everywhere. Inside the pipe, there's some, there's some room to move. The air pressure inside the pipe can go above or below atmospheric pressure without immediately being squelched by the surrounding air. And so that's what's going on in a wind instrument, is the pressure inside the pipe is surging above and below atmospheric pressure. And it's that column of air that's doing the vibrating. And some of this, I, because the, the problem set will have dragged you through some of this already. But uh, so here, here it is anyway. What's vibrating then is, is that air. And just, uh, well, I'll pick a pipe. So just if this is the pipe, just as a hand demonstration item, it's open. At, this one's open at both ends, and so the simplest mode of oscillation of the air in this pipe is when the air rushes in both ends, and we'll talk about why this would ever happen uh, in a minute. The air rushes in both ends and uh, starts to accumulate some momentum inward on towards your left on the right side and towards your right on the left side. And the air then piles up in the middle. It, 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 it rushes in and accumulates in the middle. The pressure in the middle surges above atmospheric. So, so the air becomes extra dense, extra high pressure in the middle. When that happens, there, is, there are forces pushing away from the high pressure towards low pressure. I'm out of hands. I always would love to have. I want to be able to do it with my hands. I'm not going to hold it in my mouth. Ah, okay. Bench. Can you guys see that? No, probably not. Here we go. Over here. So the air rush. It has to roll off. On it. The air rushes in both ends and accumulates a surge in pressure in the middle. That high pressure in the middle creates forces that push out, and the air begins to accelerate out and it begins to flow out. And as it flows out, it accumulates momentum outward. And it goes out all the way to the point where, and I'll talk in a minute about equilibrium, where there's low pressure in the middle. It, it has gone too far. The pressure has gone below atmospheric in the middle. And now the air accelerates inward and rushes in, and then it rushes out, and then it rushes in, rushes out. 
it's oscillating about equilibrium. What's the equilibrium? Uniform pressure and uniform density. So what, what, what's happening is it, it's, another, it's another coasting through equilibrium overshooting, coasting through equilibrium overshooting, coasting through equilibrium. It's doing the same thing again, but now it's the air column doing this. So the air rushes in. It goes, it, it reaches equilibrium momentarily where the, where the pressure is uniform, but it's moving. It's coasting. It coasts right past that equilibrium and, and piles up. And then it turns around and starts heading out, and it goes right through equilibrium again, but it's, got, but it's moving. It's heading outward. It coasts right through equilibrium and goes, it undershoots in pressure. It goes below atmospheric, and then above atmospheric, then below. Can, it, can you follow that? I'm just sort of hand, hand waving it. But the pressure surges up and down and up and down in the middle of the tube. And you get an oscillation. I can't get that one going for myself with my mouth, but I can do it with a straw. To get that motion going in a straw, it turns out I can do it by blowing across the straw. And you've probably done this kind of thing. I'll show you when you've done it before. If I blow across the straw, if the air happens for some random reason to be heading into the straw, my air will join it. It will push, it will deflect my airstream into the straw as I blow across. And that will build up the flow in. So I can actually get it bouncing. I, I view this as air bouncing in and out of the straw. I can help it bounce by blowing across it. Do you, you hear the sound? It, it's, a, uh, it's about that pitch. Is it okay? Uh, the question then comes, what if I cover the bottom? Is this a question? Is that written down as a question? Not anymore. If I cover the bottom and make it and change the column from being, well, before I even do that, just for fun. What if I put a second straw in it and make it twice as long? Surely you've done this at some restaurant when you're bored. The grown-ups are all talking about the election. Or not. Now it's twice as long. The world's least least convincing demonstrations. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a much lower pitch. It's an octave lower than before. I'll just tell you. It's, the column's twice as long. Why, why should that affect the pitch? Because what's oscillating is the air, and the air has a mass. And the, and the air's mass is the inertial part of this harmonic oscillator. It's a harmonic oscillator again, OK? Boring, same old thing. Um, harmonic oscillator, part of, part of my problem is I sort of pinched off the hole and didn't assemble my double straw very well. It's got twice the mass it had before. The other thing is the restoring influence in air in a column. And what is the influence? Well, it's, it has to do with the differences in pressure, because those are what push on fluids. Remember, fluids accelerate in the direction of uh, pr down pressure gradients, from high pressure to low pressure. Well, if the pressure goes from high to low, if this is high and this is low, and they're very close together, there's a very strong gradient in pressure, and the pushes are, so, are, are severe. It's, it's steep. It's a steep pressure, a steep, a steep variation in pressure, and the forces are big. If, the, if this is high pressure and this is low pressure and they're far apart, the pressure gradient is very gradual, and the forces involved are weak. So di when you've got differences in pressure and they're separated by enormous distances, who cares? Not much happens. But when you've got differences in pressure and they're close together, that really affects the, 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 the air in the middle. It accelerates like crazy. So the, the point is that when you have longer pipes, there's more mass. And that by itself, more inertia means things, things happen slower. The, that, that by itself would lower the pitch, lower the frequency. But also, the restoring influences associated with pressure and pressure, vari pressure variations gets weaker and less stiff to use that, that, the language of a spring. And so that by itself would lower the frequency and the pitch. 
So we have both things working together to lower the frequency and pitch when you make the pipe longer. And I'll show you this in a minute. Longer pipes, the columns of air move more slowly back and forth, lower pitch. So that's why when assembling double length uh, does that. I, I can do, I'll do better with, with this. I still have to show you what happens when you, when you close the bottom of the tube. Can you hear the pitch at all? What if I put it on like this? Now I'll close the bottom. Pitch went down by an octave. Closed. Open. Closed. So you can start to see the origin of some of the things you're doing with musical instruments when you're closing holes. You're changing. Uh, the structure of, the, of, the, of the, tr the container in which the air column is vibrating, and you can shift the, the pitch around. The, the most extreme cases is a factor of two by closing the pipe. How did, how did that happen? When you close the bottom of the pipe, why does that change the uh, pitch by a factor of two? Lower. It's because once you do that, air can't rush in and out of the bottom. The bottom is now a protected region too. And what happens is air rushes only in from the top the open end, it goes all the way in and piles up at the closed end. Not in the middle of the pipe anymore, but rather at the closed end of the pipe. That's where the pile up occurs. The, the, the surge in pressure up and surge in pressure down. And so the tube is now effectively twice as long as it used to be. It's like, it's like two, the, the, the closed pipe like this behaves just like a double length open pipe, open open pipe. In this case, air rushes in both ends and piles up in the middle where my, where my hand is. In this case, the air rushes in one end and it piles up where my hand is. It's the same. It's just there's no important difference between an open, open tube that's, that's this long and an open, closed tube that's this long. They're very similar. All right? So the reason I wanted to say that is, is, is this. this. This is a better musical instrument. <laughs> Right. Now I'm using the, this effect. This is, this is the whistle effect. You, like when you, the whistle, the sports whistles, you know, penalty, whatever they do. Right. right. Those whistles, what those are, is you're blowing air across, the, across an opening with the help of some structures in the, in the whistle, whistle. And if air happens to be, if the air is oscillating in the whistle structure, in the, the, the container itself, the air is, uh, is oscillating in. That means air is rushing in the mouth and out of the mouth, in the mouth, out of the mouth, alternately. It's piling up in the bottom alternately as well. If you blow across that whistle opening, your, the air from your, from your blow uh, can be deflected by the stream of air going in or out of, the, uh, out of the hole. If the air happens to be going in the hole at the time you're at this moment, your air is deflected into the hole as well and you add to the air that is bouncing inside the bottle. So that's why blowing across an opening like this helps the bounce and builds it up, makes it stronger and stronger. You have seen this not only in whistles and blowing across bottles. This is the effect when you're driving in a car with all the windows closed and one person cracks one window. And usually this is the passenger opening the crack and you are sitting there as the driver. What do you feel? You feel this pressure in your ears. I hope this is familiar to everybody, right? It's, it's very irritating, and you wonder, like, why, did it, why isn't it bothering them? It isn't bothering them because the passenger is sitting over here. You, it's a whistle. The air is it's now the, the wind passing the car, blowing across the mouth of this crazy bottle. They're sitting here, pretty much at the mouth of the bottle, and all they're experiencing is a wind in and wind out alternately into the car, out of the car, into the car, out of the car, up into that window. It doesn't bother them very much. It's just a wind. For you, you're down here at the base of the, of the whistle where the air is accumulating to high pressure and then to low pressure, and then high pressure and low pressure. You're in different regions of the oscillation. They're in the region in which the speed is going, it, it, velocity is going in, out, in, out, in, out. You're in the region where the pressure is going up, down, up, down, up, down. Can you, can you sense that? And your solution is to crack open your window too, and now you're in some more complicated system where neither of you is, a, is, is sitting in the, the, the surging pressure up and down. It doesn't bother you as much. 
that okay? Uh, about this, you know, just sort of give me some. The, the air column that's vibrating in here with, with only one opening, it's, it's rushing in, accumulating down here to high pressure. Then it rushes out, and this goes to low pressure. Then it rushes in to go to high pressure, and so on. The length of that column matters. The pitch is associated with that length. And the shorter that length becomes, the higher the pitch gets. And I can shorten the, pit, shorten the length <coughs> by adding water. <coughs> right? So I, this I hope you can hear. <coughs> Um, two more things to show you with air comps and one more overall story to tell. The air, in, you know, this is an open, open pipe, right? Open to both ends. Um, in principle, I could get the air going. Actually, it works. Is there very, there's a low pitch sound in there. I don't know whether you can hear it. I can hear it. It's not great. But it's in there. That's the fundamental mode, which the air is rushing in both ends and piling up in the middle. But the air can rush in in different ways. The air can actually rush in, uh, in and out, with both ends, and it can pile up not just in one, right in the middle, but it can actually pile up in, in, in two places about like that and that, in which case the column is vibrating as, as a one and a half. I gotta be careful. It can, it can develop pat, patchiness. I, 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 I'm not gonna be able to pull this out of thin air. The exact structures of the, of the, of, the, uh, m of multiple uh, multiple anti-nodes of pressure. A remember, an anti-node is, is, a, is a location of maximum fluctuation. It was like the middle of a s vibrating spring. String. You can get anti-nodes of pressure. In the fundamental mode, it's, it's where my hand is. That's the anti-node of pressure. It surges up, surges down, surges up. In a, you can also get multiple anti-nodes where, so where one, this one surges up as that one surges down, and then that one surges up as that one surges down. I think that's an allowed vibration. And you can get three antinodes and four antinodes and so on. And that's what's happening when I go at different speeds. The, lo the lowest speed gets mostly the fundamental. That's the fundamental, right? If I go faster, I get, this is the, it's the, uh, it's the harmonic, it's the second harmonic. That's the third harmonic. That's the fourth harmonic. Th those, are, those are the harmonics where it's vibrating as, as one whole, whole column, two half columns, three one third columns, and so on. And those are, incidentally, are the pitches of a bugle. You know, have you ever heard a bugler play? They've only got a certain set of pitches to work with. They can't do everything in between, not, or not easily. They can, they can play with their, they're using their mouth to, to, to bend the notes a little. But they're basically having to work with the, with the harmonics. And so, so all bugle mu music is written for those specific notes that are accessible by way of the harmonic. All right? Uh, incidentally, the, sa the different sounds, the different, the different sounds of the different stringed instruments in part come from their ability to mix, to blend the different harmonics of the strings. The same for the wind instruments. Different wind instruments make different blends of those, of those harmonics. Uh, a flute is pretty good at making a pure, fundamental tone only. The, the flute is almost pure fundamental oscillation. So it's got a very clear flute-like sound. Some of the other instruments are more complicated. Uh, the horns, for example, make, make, have a lot of high pitches in them that are created by the overtones the, or, the, or the harmonics, uh, the more complicated vibrational modes. All right, what I want to show you is, this is just for fun and game stuff, among other things. To play these, a pipe this big, you know, I, first of all, I can do it, but I, you know, I may not be, I'm not that much of a blowhard. All right. But I can get it going, oddly enough, with convective, the flow of, con of, of uh, air by way of convection from a hot source. Come on. Well, that's, you, you, you get the idea of the pitches there. This is not very... Um, 
not as intense as I'd like. This is a longer pipe, more mass. There we go. And it blew the flame out, of course. See, the oscillation got so vigorous that it stopped the burner. Okay. And now, the big burst out here. <laughs> Blew the flame out again. No. I explode in flame myself. So you get the idea. And a, a fun version of this demonstration. What? Ah, oh, stay. It, it listen to me. This one's. I'll tell you why this is a cheat. It's got a piece of metal in there. It's it's actually the convection currents that are driving the motion. So it's, instead of it being a whistle, it's the convection that comes from natural buoyancy of hot air. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to heat this piece of metal gauze. There's metal gauze hiding in here. And normally I could do this as a trick going, how did that work? But I'll just I'll give away the secret. So I'm going to heat the gauze up. OK, it should be now nice and hot. And you need convection. Not quite. I'll heat it up again. Yeah. All right. Stop. Okay. Yes, boss. Sorry. Right. All right. So those are that's air, air vibrating, and I gotta be careful because it get really hot. Uh, air vibrating in the confines of a pipe, and so most of the winds instruments are pipes. The pipes are not always uniform. Some of the pipes are, are conical. They're, they're narrower at the place where, you, where your mouth goes than they are far away. Certainly the clarinets like this or saxophone. And that gives different, a different pattern of harmonics and therefore a different sound to the, the uh, instrument. Those, but all these instruments so far have involved the, the, the vibration of something that has only one important dimension the length of a the extent of a string from left to right, or, or the extent of a column of air from uh, top to bottom. Those, those linear systems tend to, be, tend to have harmonics. Rather, you know, overtones are the general, more complicated vibrational patterns that are available to, a, to a, some extended object. So those overtones in general are the, the complicated ways something can vibrate. And things that have only one important dimension, that are essentially one dimensional, like strings and columns of air, have very simple overtone vibrations. They are the harmonics. They are integer multiples of the fundamental frequency. And they are typically the extended thing that's vibrating, vibrating as two half length pieces, or three one third length pieces, or four one fourth length pieces. The string subdivides neatly into halves thirds, quarters, and so on. The, the column of air subdivides nicely into halves, thirds, quarters, fifths, and so on. But if you have a surface, not surface, if you have a, an extended object that has more than one important dimension, like the head of a drum, now it's, it has a fundamental vibrational mode, and it has overtones, which are the more complicated vibrational modes, but they're not harmonics anymore. Because you can't subdivide something like a drum head into a, a, a circular one, into half drum head or a third drum head. You, you can't, it's, it's slicing a pie up into two half pies. No. It gets all messy when you do that. It's probably messy anyway if you didn't cook it long enough. Um, I'm thinking of Thanksgiving. Um, so the, the, the point is that surfaces are, there are a number of, Musical instruments that, that involve surfaces, cymbals, drums, a gong, I guess. But they have fundamental vibrational modes and overtone modes. The overtone modes usually are not simple multiples, integer multiples of the fundamental. And they don't sound the same to our ears. They sound more dissonant and complicated, which is why drums are, they don't sound so musical. They sound more rhythmic. Just that there's more of a thump to it than there is some clear tone. And what I want to show you is the vibrational structures that, that come up 
when you make a surface vibrate. And it's possible to do this using sand. Use the camera. I'll put it on the sand to get you. So what you're doing right now is you're, is you're looking down on this square piece of metal. So it's a square piece of metal. And we're going to shake the piece of metal up and down in the middle. And that will get it vibrating. And we can get it vibrating in its fundamental vibrational mode, which will be just the whole surface going, the middle going up one way, and the, other, the rest of it going down, and then the middle going down, the rest of it going up, back and forth. That's the fundamental vibrational mode. But it's going to have other ways it can vibrate. And by putting sand on it, we will be able to see the parts of the surface that pretty much sit still. The parts that move up and down a lot will, sh will drive the sand away. But the parts that sit still, the nodes, the vibrational nodes, like the ends of the string or the middle of a string that's vibrating in its second harmonic mode that has a mo motionless spot, the sand will accumulate in the motionless spots. So I'll put some sand on. There's some sand. And now I'm going to start it vibrating. And supposedly. Okay, so, so that is, that's the fundamental vibration. The middle's going one way, the edges are going the other, and the sand is, is piling up here in the in-between. That's the vibrational node. It's no longer a point as it would be in a string. It's a line, because we're, we're one dimension higher. If I go to... series of patterns. Seven, seven, four. You're seeing that as, the, as these surfaces vibrate, they have very complicated patterns of, of portions that move, what, that move violently, the, the anti-nodes, and the portions that don't move at all, the nodes. Uh, but there's never a moment where, for example, the square piece, this, it, its fundamental vibrational mode of the square piece was, was almost a square rotated uh, 45 degrees and plopped on the square. That was the simplest way in which you could vibrate. There's no the, the more complicated vibrational modes look nothing like that and therefore are not related to the fundamental vibrational frequency by any simple uh, integer multiple. The overtones, therefore, are all at just almost idiosyncratic pitches and they don't sound very musically related to the, to the fundamental. They're not octaves apart, for example. And so that's why surfaces sound so complicated. Uh, the surface instruments just don't sound as musical as the, as the linear stringed or woodwind instruments. All right, with that, I will stop talking about musical instruments and this material in general. Uh, enjoy the rest of the semester, and uh, hopefully I'll see you sometime or other.